I uh, really want you to know that our commitment is uh, deep, and we see that uh, in the months and years ahead, we'll be able to work very well together and to accomplish good things for uh, you, for your children, and for generations uh, that will follow us. So thank you so much for inviting us to be a part of that, and uh, we are very grateful uh, to be working with you. Dr. Laguerre is an amazing individual, and we're very blessed in this county to have him. Uh, we can trot ideas before him, and he grabs them, and it is amazing what has happened in your tenure as superintendent, so it's amazing for us all. I also want to thank Dr. Butel for giving me some talking points. She was very insistent that I keep my remarks really brief, but there are two problems with this. One, I have some introductions to make, and two, I'm a politician, so the remarks <laughs> might be longer. The first thing I want to do is to recognize our Vice Mayor, Alan Schwartzman. And I think we had the commission, commissioners already raise their hands, so we've done that introduction, and I don't see any other city officials. Am I missing? Okay, <laughs> thanks, Dan. Um, this, uh, this, uh, last night I attended the Goldman Awards in San Francisco, which is the 20, 20th year of the Environmental Awards, which is going to compete with the Nobel Prize. And it was um, something I started going to a while ago. I hadn't been for a few years. It's amazing. Uh, people, I don't recognize anyone anymore at all. There are more environmentalists there than I ever thought existed in the entire world. And it was just amazing and very inspiring. And so I thought, how fitting tonight that we would have this first kickoff of this lecture series. And the lecture series is really the, the kind of the apex of what the commission is all about and what the city council said, go forth and uh, educate and provide information for people so they can make the right decisions, as uh, Dr. Butel mentioned. Now, her talking points were that I was to mention that this is a five-part lecture series. Uh, we, of course, want to emphasize that it's free. We also want to emphasize that it will be inspiring and it will be informative and there will be an opportunity to follow up with questions. Uh, I mentioned that this is fulfilling the charter of the commission. It is a significant point because we did not mandate our strategies. We said that these will be accomplished through education and through working with the various sectors of the community to achieve. And lastly, um, I am personally excited about the attendance, and I know that it will grow, and I hope that you are ambassadors in your community, your neighborhood, your friends and colleagues and family, and bring them here and enjoy these lecture series. This is really a rare treat. So once again, thank you, Dr. Laguerre, and thank you, Dr. Butel. So who better to have come and talk about this than someone whose laboratory is the whole earth, you may already be able to tell that I'm not from around here. I know I talk funny. If you don't understand me, just raise your hand. I'll, I'll explain it a little faster. But I grew up, not my husband, he doesn't get this. Uh, I grew up in the swamps of East Texas. I never saw a rock or a mountain until I was 12 years old. It's hard to believe, but we always claimed that the, we had plenty of rocks. They were just a mile straight down before you got to them. So I was raised, my father was a chemical engineer. I was raised in the middle of the refineries. Okay, so I feel pretty comfortable here. But the idea of environmental stuff was just not really part of my background. Okay. I went off to college. I was going to be an engineer because my daddy was an engineer and therefore I was going to be an engineer. Hated it absolutely hated it, took a geology course my sophomore year, changed my life, changed my major, and started studying the earth, not rocks. I'm really not that much on rocks, but the earth. In fact, what I ended up specializing in is mountains, because I still remember the first mountain I ever saw and how its grandeur just awed me. So I decided I was going to figure out a way to you know, make my life in the mountains. And so I became a structural geologist. And for the research for my PhD, I went 
went and did my field research in Gates of the Arctic National Park in the Brooks Range of Alaska. Anybody have a clue where that is? Not Alaska, I'm assuming you know where Alaska is. But where in Alaska that is? Do you have some idea? Well, way up north. Way up north. Well, that's actually the best definition you can get. It is one of the largest mountain ranges in the world, and it's the only mountain range entirely north of the Arctic Circle. The mountain range is approximately the size of the state of California, and nobody lives there. It's just too, too harsh, too wild, too remote. And so we got there, and when they asked if I wanted to go there, I said, sure. I was young. I was dumb. I was from Texas. Sure, drop me off in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness, which they did, <laughs> literally. Have any of you watched that show, that Flying Wild Alaska, that's come on, where they go land on those gravel bars? That's what they did. They dumped me and my pack and four other geologists out and said, we'll be back in a month. <laughs> and after that, it was all helicopter coming to... To, to get us food, you know, so once a month a helicopter would come and bring us more food and move our camp. So this was my exposure to wilderness. And I can tell you the moment, the instant that I became really cognizant of the impact that an individual can have on their environment. So we were camped out there in the tundra, no trees, no nothing, just us, the caribou, and the grizzly bears. And little bitty blueberry plants. So I'd seen these, and on the first helicopter trip out, I sent a postcard to my sister saying, send me some canning jars. I'm going to make blueberry jam on my Coleman stove in the middle of the Arctic. Okay, so she sent me... Uh, the canning jars on the next helicopter trip that came in a month later and she was so proud of herself because she was knew that this was going to have to go through all this transportation and she didn't want them to break so she had packed them really well using styrofoam peanuts I did not know this and I opened the box out there in the middle of this incredibly pristine wilderness that, I mean, no humans had ever seen this valley I was standing in when I opened it on that windy day. <laughs> and styrofoam peanuts. We spent days chasing peanuts because we were determined not to leave that be our mark on this. But that to this day stuck in my mind that every little decision you make, every little act has these consequences. Okay. So that's when I got started and then I've had lots more opportunities. I've since traveled around the world studying the earth and studying mountains and have had a chance to see lots of different cultures and how they've adapted to the world and how their choices and their cultures and their actions have had impact on their surroundings, some for the good, some for the bad. And this has just given me sort of this real sort of global sense of how humans and the land interact. Because when I travel around the world doing geology, I have probably been to fewer cathedrals and museums than anybody else who's been to as many countries as I have. Because when I go there, I don't go to the cathedrals and the museums. I'm out there in the mountains, in the middle of nowhere, looking at the rocks and with the people there. And so I got into this whole idea of sustainability and started preaching about sustainability. I helped start the recycling program in El Paso, Texas, where I was a professor at the university for a while. And I helped do all this stuff. And I was preaching the word. And then one day, somebody asked me a very simple question, which is, what does sustainability mean? And I was stumped. So I'm going to give you a moment. Could you just pass some of those back? And could you pass some of these? I stole these from the library. <laughs> I'm frugal, too. 
pass them around. And just take a moment while I get my notes out and we get the uh, computer going to try to write down a definition of the word sustainability. Right? Because this is a term we all use. You all recognize it, I'm sure, when you saw the flyer. But trying to write out a definition of what it means, I found challenging. Who, who thinks they have a pretty good handle? Okay, so living in such a way that any, let's just call it sort of man-made substances get recycled in some way, and any natural substance that's used gets reused or reintegrated back into the system. Exactly. It's a closed system. Okay, so she's coming at it from this angle of the things we make and the things we use, which is one very critical component of sustainability. Did anybody have a different approach? This is a conservation approach. If you use it, you replace it in some equal measure. I saw another hand. Act in such a way, you have said it beautifully, could you repeat it? To ensure the continuity of planet Earth and all of its life forms for eternity. Okay, that's beautiful. And it gets in all these. So these are the, this is the practical side of the room. <laughs> these are the engineers. These are the philosophers. Okay, the world needs both. Okay, so there are as many different definitions as there are people probably. Um, the one that I had selected is, uh, and I just chose the, the US EPA website because they said it pretty well, this idea of meeting society's present needs without compromising the needs of the future. Right, so this is the idea of sustaining planet Earth, I shouldn't use the word sustaining in the definition, but uh, uh, how did you say it? To ensure the continuity of planet Earth. But meeting the needs of today without jeopardizing the needs of future generations. Okay. Now, so this is a pretty basic thing, and there's all sorts of practical ways to make this happen by replacing what you use, by being careful what you make, having goals. But the city of Benicia has a goal of sustainability, and I was given this quote, which is right here out of the general plan for the city of Benicia. Right? There, your city is way ahead of the curve on this one. Way to go. Um, but it's the same idea. So it, this is actually taken from the Minnesota legislature. Started this. So they're ahead of the curve too. It's the Minnesota thing. Um, so they go into this whole thing about enhancing economic opportunity and community well-being, blah, blah, blah. Sustainable development meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Okay, or in the case of Benicia, a sustainable community meets the needs of the present without compromising the needs of the future. And my understanding is this is really sort of the goal of many of the citizens of Benicia is to make this a sustainable community that thrives today but allows the future to thrive as well. Okay. Now, when most people think about sustainability, the first word that comes to mind, this is often the picture, maybe not a word, but a picture that springs into people's heads. So, I admit I'm a nutty environmentalist. I shave a little more often than this guy, but I do go out and hug trees occasionally, spend a lot of time with my hands in the dirt, but I'm also a pragmatist, okay, yeah, so I try to walk that line, but it's not, being sustainable does not require being nuts. But it does require an interest in the environment. So how many of you people, you people, I'm trying not to say y'all 
it'll slip out eventually. But how many of y'all uh, came here tonight expecting to hear a talk on the environment? Yeah, don't, don't be shy. You know, I'm not, I didn't bring any rocks to throw at anybody. I left them at home. Of course we're going to talk about the environment. You can't talk about sustainability without it. Okay, it's an essential component of it. And when we talk about environmental issues, we're usually talking about natural resource use, right? Um, but also pollution prevention, things like this. But that's only part of sustainability, right? Sustainability is not just about avoiding pollution and natural resources, but this is the reason, how many of you had had, would have got, heard about a talk like this 10 years ago? What were the odds of going to a talk on sustainability 10 years ago? No. You know, it's a new, I mean, people were talking about it. So it's not that it wasn't on the radar, but it wasn't yet to the point where you were getting the library and filling a room with people wanting to talk about it. What has changed is this real interest in the environment and understanding the effect we're having on it and the fact that if we keep going like we're going, our kids are not going to have a very good place to live or our grandkids or our great kids. It's hard to quantify exactly, but it's, we're not, we're having a good life, but we are compromising the needs of the future, of the way that we've been going. Okay. So environmental issues are not the only thing we care about. When you, so what are some environmental issues that you think about? Water. Water. Okay, big news in California and going to get bigger. I don't know how many of you are aware of the fact that your water usage needs to be cut by 20% by 2020. Right? So if you're not aware of that, uh, talk to your local landscape architect. You need to make some changes probably. Or you may already be there, uh, but, but water is a big issue. What else? Soil. Soil. Huge. There are parts of the world, we're doing reasonably well in the U.S. because the Dust Bowl taught us some, but there are parts of the world where the soil is going away at a mind-blowing pace. Um, I heard a quote that all that stands between civilization and chaos is six inches of topsoil. You know, if you lose that six inches of topsoil, that's the breakdown of civilization right there. Okay, so we've got water, we've got soil. What else? Air quality. Air quality. Absolutely. So air quality, soil conservation, water quality. Now, in California, let's go back to water. Because this has just been in the news. Not so much the last few months, because all we can talk about now is the budget. But a year ago, it was all about water. And what was the big debate about with water? Who cares about water? Fish versus farms versus... Versus people, really. Uh, not, not that farms, you know, and, and fish aren't people too, but really we're talking about cities versus agriculture versus fish and also then the recreation uses of, of the water. Okay. Those are not environmental issues. Those are people, right? So... Uh, and I hope I have this in the right order. No, I didn't. So let, let me back up. I never can. I've got three things to say, and I can never remember which order I put my slides in. So it's partly people, and it's partly money. Yeah. Right? Because when we're talking about farms, we're talking about our economy. And so the second leg, or pillar, it's often called the three pillars of sustainability, is economic. If we're going to be able to be sustainable, it has to make economic sense as well. Because we can solve a lot of the world's problems if you just throw enough money at it or enough resources at it. But then that means you can't do a bunch of other things that need to be done as well. So to be a sustainable community, 
you want to take care of the economic well-being of Benicia. I'm assuming the mayor wants this to stay a reasonably economically viable place to live. You can have the most beautiful, wonderful, pristine environment, but if you can't afford to live there and have a community there, what good does it really do? And then the third one is the social component. So when you talk about economics, I skipped over it. I think I had something like profit and growth and savings. Okay, right? So that's economics. And then with social, we're talking about things like community, education, the standard of living. You know, so often called social equity. So if I wanted to be more wordy, I might put in there social equity. So we've got these three different you can either view them in the adversarial way of competing interests or in a more collaborative way of supporting interests of these three pillars that are holding up any community or society. So we have to address all three of these issues for any idea of sustainability. If you only look at two of them in making your plans for your community, the system's not going to be sustainable. So think about it. If all you think about is social justice and economic growth and profits and things like that, uh, the system is not going to work well and the environment will be hurt. Can you think of an example of a place where the social and economic considerations were taken into account and the environment was ignored? Okay, so expansion and growth of uh, uh, unplanned growth, which takes away the soil but also makes it impossible for the water to get into the ground. So it could be like a poor construction. Subdivision. Sub urban sprawl or suburban sprawl, absolutely. Because this can make really nice communities. I grew up in Levittown. I actually lived my first three years in Levittown, Illinois. And those of you who don't know Levittown, that was the original little planned housing community from which suburbs grew. Here I am. Okay, I was in Texas the rest of the time, but we spent three years in Chicago in one of the original Levittown subdivisions. But you can have nice communities grow up there, uh, good Growth, high quality. I claim the entire Industrial Revolution basically did this, right? The standard of living improved. There was economic growth, but it was built on massive exploitation of natural resources, right? So there's been this phenomenal growth throughout much of the world, but at the cost of this extraction of resources. Other ideas? Mm-hmm. Anytime you talk about mining or logging, anytime, really when we're talking here, we're talking usually about extraction of resources in some way. Strip mining. Uh, the mountain ranges, or like in West Virginia, the coal mines that are stripping off the tops of the mountains, things like this. This is still causing local economic well-being. You may have black lung, but your family is eating. Or I have been watching this show on TV that my husband recorded for me. It's about people living on the edge. What? I don't remember what it's called. Human Planet. If y'all haven't seen this, get your TiVo out recording this, okay? It's called The Human Planet. And it's on, you know, I don't know, Discovery Channel or which one? Discovery Channel, but they had this thing last night about people in the mountains. So they had people from Mongolia and the Himalayas and this island in Indonesia where they were getting sulfur out of the volcano. And they were doing this because it was the only way to make enough money to feed their family. So it, it meets these needs. Agribusiness, right? Depleting our aquifers, polluting our soil and our waterways, but for a short term, good money in it, good com farming communities, lovely, 
but you know some downside. So if you just meet these two, uh, oh, and I'm sorry. Let me go. How do I go back? Where these two overlap, as you can see here, we usually call this equitable. Really, sort of meets the needs of the people, but is ignoring uh, the environment. Now, if you take a look at environmental issues and economic issues, that intersection is called viable. Don't care about those people, basically, right? We're leaving out the people component here and we're doing money and the environment. Can you think of an example of this? This one I struggled with a little more to come up with some examples. Okay, so flood man management, because it, it does tend, that's an easy place to, to make the water go, right? So it's cheap, it's sort of working for the environment to save the flooding, but we'll see there. Or a similar example that I came up with was in New York City, public transportation in New York City, which is saving energy and it's reducing pollution, but all the bus depots and everything are in Harlem. Okay, so they get all the pollution and all the downside of what is saving everybody else money and is helping our energy consumption. Absolutely, the country as a whole makes money and it definitely helps the environment because you often set aside these big preserves for the animals and the, the land. But the local people are often, not always, ecotourism is not so bad. It's regular tourism to these places that's usually bad. If it's truly fitting the ecotourism thing, then it's supposed to be taking the people into account as well. So I went... Uh, I actually took a class to Ecuador uh, to t learn about natural resources, conservation of natural resources, and we went down into the Amazon basin. So we did the high Andes, and we did the Amazon basin, and we went down to this place where they only let small groups come in at a time, and the money was used to build hospitals and to promote sustainable agriculture. So it can be done, but just a Ten miles away, there was a place where they'd raised the forest to keep all the bugs away from the tourists, and they'd put out tennis courts so that you could say you'd been to the Amazon and never, you know, really touched it. Um, another example I came up with here is the one-child policy in China. Right? Because that made good economic sense because and good environmental sense because one of the biggest environmental issues we have, and none of you mentioned this, but it's people. If there were no people on this planet, we would not be having a problem with the environment. Okay, so save the environment, get rid of the people, you know. But overpopulation, I still remember when I was in college, and we're not mentioning the year, but you might be able to figure it out if I tell you that I actually still have somewhere a little business card sized thing that said, the gang of four billion. We were looking forward to when the world population was going to hit four billion. We're now at what, seven? Okay, six, six something, and it's pro it'll probably be seven by the time this talk is over. <laughs> okay, so population growth is one of the biggest stresses on the environment. So the one-child policy in China made great economic sense, great environmental sense, but has had just really some devastating cultural and social implications on uh, their, their society. Um, the Galapagos is sort of that ecotourism one. So then the third option meets the social needs and the environmental needs. This is what we call bearable. Uh, so you're not going to have it you know, comfortable, but you'll be bearable. So what's something that meets social people and money? I'm sorry, people and the environment, not the money.
Ooh, I stumped you. What do they call these, these communities that go out in the country and try to be self-sustaining? Okay, so like a commune. Uh, it's not that way anymore, but it's now, you, you, you know what he's talking about, these self-sustaining things. Yeah, so a policy of eating only organic, locally grown foods, yeah. right? That's admirable in its own way, you know, so this makes for a good community because you're buying from your local farmers and things like this. So it can, going to the farmer's market builds a real sense of community, makes you healthy, it's good for the environment. Seven billion people, however, it's probably not going to make economic sense to try to feed all of New York's Manhattan on locally grown organic foods, much as we would perhaps like to. So um, that would be one option. Another one would be almost any environmental regulation, right? Haven't you been hearing about CO2? Uh, the tax on carbon dioxide or, um, I forget the word, uh, so cap and trade, things like this. Right? The businesses don't like that, right, because it doesn't help them economically. So the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, cap and trade, any of these environmental regulations are pretty good for society. It's for the health of society and things like this, good for the environment but not necessarily so good for but economics. improving the health of the society is actually economically... Absolutely. So she, she's, called my, she's called my bluff. I was hoping nobody would notice that what I'm doing is I'm talking in hyperbole. All right. So we should really have a little circle for economics here. And on all of these, you can never completely do away with one of the three. So you're absolutely right. But I have never let the facts get in the way of a good story. My father taught me that. I'm from the South. You can't let the facts get in the way of a good story. But she is right. Okay. Um, so we've got all of these different things and the, the goal and this is the goal for Benicia, is to take into account all three of these, not let anyone shrink in importance, not let anyone dominate. And this area here where the sun is shining is the goal, where it meets the economic needs of the community, the social justice or the social equity, helps the, the entire population of the community while sustaining the environmental needs, not causing damage, hopefully working better to meet the needs of the future. That is the goal. That is that little window where a community or a culture or a, a town, whatever it is, can be sustainable, is meeting all three of those needs. And it's a moving target, okay, which is, you know, unfortunate, but it is. Uh, but that has got to, we don't want to live in a world that's bearable. We don't want to live in a world that's viable. We don't want even want to live in a world that's equitable. We want to live in a world that is truly sustainable, that is allowing us to thrive, but is also allowing future generations to thrive which then takes us to the sort of the, the burning question, how can we do this here in Benicia? And I'm not going to try to answer that question. That's not my role. My, my role is to pose the question, and it's your job to answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, another example that I just learned about which horrified me because I thought I was doing something good. It's one of these things where you think you're doing something good for the environment and then you find out that it's not, but I don't yet know what the right answer is. How many of you have taken an old computer monitor or something to one of these electronic recycling things? Right? And didn't you feel good about that? I felt good about it. In fact, at the college, I sponsored one. Bring it in. Do you know where that stuff goes? Most of it goes to southern China, where kids take it apart and then they burn it to extract the heavy metals from it. 
So we are not polluting our country. We're shipping it over there and polluting the people and their environment. I was horrified. Now, like I said, I don't know what the alternative is. So I wish I could say that's horrible. So here's what you should do with your old computer monitor. Stick it in your attic until somebody figures out what you should do with your old computer monitor. I, I don't know. If you find out about it, I'll give you my card and you can tell me because I really want to know. But most of these where they do not charge you to return your computer monitors, and in some places they'll even pay you five bucks or something for it, most of them are just shipping it either to China or parts of Africa uh, to do this. We keep making steps, but you can't give up. You can't stop buying those light bulbs because there's another problem. We've got to just keep working at it, and each time we get a little better. It's like you know, that, that idea, the old adage of you can never get the door. You keep going halfway, and then halfway, and then halfway. You never get there, but you sure get closer. And that's, that's sort of, you, you can't be daunted by the My father's a chemical engineer. And he always said, oil is too valuable to burn. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's too valuable to burn. And our planet is too valuable to waste. So you are all already, I, I know I'm talking to the choir here, but if you don't preach to the choir, they can't spread it to anybody else. So uh, we're taking the first step. And then in the second half, Sharon? is going to take over and let you start solving the problems of the world. In two weeks, it's me. And it's me, the geologist. And the, the talk that I'm going to give in two weeks on climate change is really going to be more scientific. Because we hear about climate change, and we hear about global warming, and we hear about greenhouse effect. And yet many of us don't really quite know the whole greenhouse effect and why is carbon dioxide doing this and the whole bit. So I'm planning to spend next class really getting down to sort of the nitty gritty about what is global warm, what is climate change, which really is we call global warming, um, and what is causing it? What is the greenhouse effect? How is it functioning?